and turn to John chapter 15, page 16, 1676. Yeah, that way. John chapter 15, with it, which is Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches. Last Sunday, Debbie and I were in Solvang, California. Been up to Solvang, anybody? And we got a chance to drive through the, uh, not through the fields, but through the roads that go through the, the vineyards. And this time of the year, it's interesting to see the vineyards because obviously there's nothing there. So you can see the vines that come up out of the ground. And I was amazed how big they were. I mean, they're like this size. And they come up, and then there's a trellis, you know. And so the vine goes sideways, parallel to the ground, on the trellis. And what I was impressed me the most was all of the branches are cut back to about that length. So every year the vine dressers must go through, cut everything back, and waiting for the next growth to come. There's a, there's a lesson there about the kingdom of God, I think, as well. So anyway, I thought about that, and so here we have this gospel lesson for today, okay? So I'm going to begin with verses 1 through 8, and you're going to pick up 9 through the end. Jesus said, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser, or gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If one remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Go ahead. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name, and this is my command, love each other. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Now turn to Romans chapter 10, page 1760, 1760. And we're going to divide this up as well. Today we continue our series on motivation for mission. And we are in this five-week process of Bible study. And one of the things that I'm beginning to understand more and more clearly is that we really have to see ourselves differently as a congregation and as individual believers. And that begins with me. And so the sermon for today is to share that with you and for us to realize that we, the paradigm for us needs to change quite significantly. I'm going to begin with verse 9 and then you pick up at 14 and 15, okay? Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
It is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the Bible says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please join me. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Go back to verse 14 and 15. This is a chain. There's five statements for how can they questions. And it begins at the end and it ends up at the beginning. Now let's go through this. The first is how can they call on the one which really is an act of faith in whom they have not believed. Number two, how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard. Number four, how can they hear unless someone preaches to them, unless there is a message that comes to them. And finally, how can the, someone preach unless they are sent? Key word today is sent. God has entrusted to you and me and to every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ a responsibility. Your responsibility and mine, one of them is that you and I are sent to search for those who do not have the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. Let me say that again. Because I think we have to a great degree forgotten that in the kingdom of God. God has called you and has given you and me the responsibility to seek and to search for those who do not have a relationship with our Lord to share the gospel. You are called individually. Today is very personal. This is not about us. This is about you and about me. God has entrusted us to share the gospel. Whether people accept it or not, that is not up to us. We don't have to win the argument. We don't have to convert them. Not up to us. Ours is simply to share. We are sent personally to share the message. Now, I want you to know something. This has been a stirring four or five weeks in my life. This Bible study has bothered me significantly. God has convicted me. <clears throat> And I've tried to put it in words, and the best words I can say is, I'm awfully busy doing the work of the church. But I'm not that busy doing the work of Jesus in sharing the gospel. Now, I do that. But I do it primarily with those who believe or those who are on, on the verge of believing. But I have gone through my life over these last three weeks and I've evaluated it, and I've got to tell you, I have missed so many opportunities to share the gospel with unchurched people that God just, one day, God put me in my truck with someone else. And I had the opportunity. And you know what I did? Nothing. And afterwards, I realized what an idiot you are. This is a very convicting time because for me personally, I have realized that witnessing, personal witnessing, doesn't even show up on my computer screen. It's not even an app. Of course, I don't have a computer screen, <laughs> but you do. It's not even an app. It doesn't even show up on my radar screen. And I think that's true for many of us. Now, I want to say as a congregation, I take great joy, great pride in how we have supported missions around the world. If you haven't looked at the map in Parish Hall and all those stars, that to me is a great joy. And I thank God that our congregation has given much money and effort and prayer for world missions. And, you know, a lot of churches have stopped giving to world missions. You know that. Because they just give to themselves. 
And I praise God for that, but I think there's a whole area that's been missing, at least in my life. And that area is for me to personally take time, intentionally witness to people with whom I come in contact with during the course of my week. I have to change my time schedule. I have to make room. Every week we have hundreds or uh, hundred, I'm going to say hundreds of folks on campus who probably don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. And I have missed so many opportunities for whatever the reason. I don't know yet all of the reasons, but I am convicted and my spirit is stirred that this is a huge part that is missing in my life and it may be missing in the life of this congregation. We have to understand something, folks, and you may. The paradigm of American Christianity has changed. For those of us who are over 50 years or close thereto, we remember the days when you built a church and the folks would come. 35 years ago, I was a young preacher in Minnesota, Bloomington, lovely suburb, and people would move from other parts of uh, the center part of America, northern, the north, wet, north uh, central, and within a few weeks, they would what? show up on our doorstep in the church and I would visit them and they did that that was part of the culture today that's not there most people and I'm going to use the term most most people are no longer turning to the church most people now in our culture we have all these different voices out there all these different religions all this spirituality and Christianity is but one of those voices. And maybe the church needs to fess up to that fact. That maybe we have contributed toward the demise of Christendom. Because we have not spoken of the things of God in many ways. We have missed thousands of opportunities in our lives. The church is, ch the world has changed for us. It is a huge shift in our paradigm that we have now in American Christianity. And those of us who are older, we remember that. Now let me say this to you. If we continue as a congregation, if we continue to do things as we have done in the past, as we continue to do, if we continue to do business, develop ministries, focus on ourselves to a great degree, this church will eventually pass away. Now you may not believe it, but it will. If we continue as we are, this church will come to an end. We'll grow old together and get smaller and smaller, just like hundreds of churches around us, and eventually the last one out will turn off the lights. We need to change. Your pastor needs to change. And I think many of us need to change. And you look at the churches around us, they didn't change. I can name many churches that were in a community huge at one time and never adapted, never came about to change. We've talked about this in our small groups. So what does this mean? We need to reevaluate how we do things. We need to renew ourselves into our vision. Our vision, which we developed five years ago in the Transforming Congregation, was good for us. You know why? Because a group of people came in and evaluated us and said, you're not as good as you think you are. Uh -huh. Ah. You know, you need a spouse to do that periodically, don't you? To tell you, you're not as good as you think you are. And the reality that that was good for us. We developed that vision statement. All we, we began that in everything that we do, there's a discipling element. Whether it's the Easter egg hunt. We're not just there to get people together and hand out chocolate. We're there to share the gospel in song. We're there to hand out books, Christian books for children. Everything we have done now, most, just like the yard sale, was always to raise money. Now we used it as an opportunity to what? Share the gospel and invite people. 
This is huge. And we need, change is good for us. It is good for us to be convicted. It is good for my spirit to be convicted and for yours. And I want to invite you over these next weeks and months to let the Holy Spirit do that to you. God has blessed us. But we need to see ourselves as missionaries. That's a hard concept. Because most of us who are raised in the church, we were not taught to be missionaries. We were taught simply to receive. Witnessing was not a big deal. It was something the pastor did, or the evangelism board, or a few other people. And today I challenge you. I challenge you to become a missionary, to witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I want to say to you, we have to learn how to witness. We don't have to beat it into people's minds. We don't have to win the argument. We don't have to be judgmental. We don't have to be hypocritical, better than thou. We simply need to learn to witness and invite and touch lives. And the Lord willing, over these next months, we will focus on that in the ministry of this church. And I want to invite you to have your spirit stirred. One of the things I want to suggest, which I do and I have begun to do, that every time you go to communion for the next two, three months, four months, not just a week or two, when you're kneeling there and you're praying, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, through this body and blood, stir my spirit. Stir in me, dear Holy Spirit that I may open up and open my eyes to see opportunities to witness and to witness the faith and invite. I challenge you to do that and see what God does in your life. I've done that on many occasions for various issues and God changes us. So when you come to communion, pray that prayer. Now finally, last part of the sermon is this. This whole business of personal sh witnessing, the authority to do so doesn't come from me, doesn't come from the church. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole business of the message of the kingdom, it's not your message, and it's not my message. It's the message of Jesus. And think about our message, you know? We, I think we gotta rethink the message we have. We got a pretty good message, folks. The message to those who think this is it, that when you're dead, life ceases to end, or there's no afterlife, or you hope whatever. We have the message that there is a God in heaven, that God created this world, and God created you and me, and God put you here with a purpose, with life, and he gives you guidance and direction. Not only that, but we believe in a universal forgiveness of sins, universal grace, not just for some, but for all. And that universal grace gives hope, gives a future beyond this life. It gives you and me eternal life, that we're not alone, that we're not just the third rock from the sun, spinning on this world, waiting for something catastrophic to happen, but that God is with us. He cares about us, he has spoken to us, and Jesus is the God of heaven and earth. That's a pretty good message, as opposed to, this is it, it's all over with. So I invite you this, these days, may the Spirit of God stir your spirit. May the Spirit of God stir my spirit. And we may add this into our lives and to see what God will do. In Jesus' name, amen.